Okay, I'm opening the second act. Good morning. Um, two things, Tom. I had an interesting experience, and I, uh, during the last session, it, it reminded me of it. it. Happened about a month ago, and it was uh, regarding being an involuntary guide for a deceased person who just passed over. It had been a cousin who uh, was about 80 years old and had been uh, an alcoholic the last 40 years of her life and had been quite mean and ornery and distanced herself from the families. But on the day she died, I sent her a blessing of love and some images when she was healthy and we were, you know, uh, good time and, and um, basically sent gratitude for her being in my life and kind of left it alone. And that night I was uh, gone to bed and as I typically do, meditated for about 30 minutes. And I had just gotten into uh, point consciousness and this ball of light about the size of a baseball I could see it, even though my eyes were closed were coming at me in a, in a dark bedroom and hit me so hard it almost knocked me off the bed I didn't know what it was at the time and in fact I was quite confused and disoriented and angry and so it took me a few minutes to collect myself and kind of separate this thing uh, that was going on within me and uh, get centered again. And I did, and then I quickly discovered that this was this cousin who had somehow grabbed onto my energy. I mean, just uh, embedded herself in me. Like, you ever saw the movie The Aliens, that thing that pops out of the guy's chest? Felt like that. <laughs> I'm going, okay. So I, hadn't, I had never done one of these things before, but uh, I took the high ground and, and uh, respected her as a, as a uh, unit of consciousness and started talking her up and tried to uh, make sense because she was, that disorientation I was feeling was her. I mean, it was just all over me. And I finally got that straightened out and, and settled her down enough uh, and talked to her for lack of a better term, sort of out of my energy field where I could, I could focus better. And uh, finally got her to, um, you know, my basic um, direction was there will be somebody to help you go to the light. Mm -hmm. This is your time. Everything will be fine, you know. And talk her down out of this, this state of confusion, disorientation, and absolute fear and, and anger just really angry. So uh, it took me a couple of days to recover from that. That was just uh, a bolt of lightning for me. So that's the first time I've ever done one of those. Um, I didn't realize, I think by sending her that, uh, that blessing, I think I opened a portal for her to come and uh, come to me because there was nobody left in the family or anywhere else that I think she could go to uh, because of how she had conduct her life in the last several years. So I'd ask you to, to uh, comment on that for a second, just to tell me if that happens to me again, what I might do different or better, or if that was probably appropriate. The second part is I want to talk about the uh, IEOC and can that be bifurcated in terms of maintaining not only a conscious presence in an avatar, but also in a non-physical reality, uh, a guide, for example, or whatever, uh, spiritual guides is, uh, for use a euphemism to explain what I'm trying to get at. Mm -hmm. All right. Okay. There's lots of different ways you could get there. In this case, because of the timing that it happened just then at that time and the fact that you had given her some positive uh, help earlier, what is likely to have happened is that when she got to the transition, you know, when she got to transition central, and there was somebody there uh, to greet, like you said, you know, everything will be all right, follow the light, you'll be fine. When she got there, she may have been, uh, hysterical isn't the right word, but uh, obsessed. She may have been so wadded up in her own mind because she was not very rational that it was difficult to work with her. Transition Central said, this lady's a mess. 
She's all wadded up. She doesn't know what's going on or who she is or why she is. She's just in a frenzy and, and is frantic and so on. Um, what are we going to do with her? Well, they noticed that you had been probably the one singular person who had been helpful and said something positive to her that she might relate to you being the helper. In other words, if somebody else says, you're all right, lady, come on, you know, come over here and do this, she wouldn't have responded. But if it was you, because you had already connected with her just as she died, then perhaps she would respond. And you could be the person that made the connection and help her calm down and just let the, the, the um, obsession or the trauma go. And then that probably is why you were just brought into it. They just tapped into you and your ability to do that. And there you were. You did it. It worked. She, quiet, she calmed down. Everything else then could take place. And that's what happened. So my guess is that you were, you were tapped for that job just because you were uniquely able to do it. That's, the main, that's probably the bigger possibility. There's a smaller possibility that the system thought that that would, because you did make that first effort at sending her some good energy and good ideas, that the system took the opportunity to give you a further lesson of giving you another opportunity to take that to maybe the next step. And that ball of light and all the rest of it was a little single player virtual reality just for you to give you that opportunity to, to interact in that way, to make those choices. Um, probably was the first one because of the timing. Had it been the second one, it wouldn't necessarily happen just then. It would have been maybe something later. It's more likely. So I think you probably just got tapped for a job and uh, you did the job and that was good. I didn't get paid for it. No, you never get paid. <laughs> well, actually you did get paid. Your pay was that you made the right choice. That was your payment and you benefited from that payment. So that's, the, that's what you got out of it was the opportunity to, to do something good for somebody. Yeah, so that would be you know, what I'd say about that. Now let's see. Give me the second one again. The IUOC, can it be bifurcated such that we not only have a conscious uh, attachment or affiliation with the free will awareness unit, but simultaneously might be able to hmm have a non-physical presence right. and uh, role uh, in development. Okay, and that question is about, and we talked just a little bit before that sometimes an IUOC can have more than one incarnation. And this question is, if there's, let's say, two incarnations, do they both have to be in the physical, or can one be in the physical and one can be in the non-physical? And the answer is yes. It can be active. Now, whether you actually call that an incarnation or just that that IUOC is able to interact in consciousness space in other ways, yes, it can interact in other ways. And even sometimes your own consciousness can be called on to do that. You can be called on, just as you did to help your cousin, you can be called on to provide guidance and help for somebody else. And you know, that has happened to me numerous times. And just because you are ready and capable to do that, and because this other person has the need, and it's going to be a win-win, you're going to have the opportunity to help somebody, and they're going, you know, and they need the help. So the system just puts those two together, and there you are. Now you've just, just like you suddenly got a job to help your cousin, you may get a job to help somebody that you've never met just because it'd be good for both of you. I had that experience once where I, I was uh, suddenly, you know, when I was in an altered state, I suddenly was sitting in a, you know, I was in a truck with a truck driver and a lady. And the truck driver 
was a real psychotic sociopath. The lady, which I didn't know why she was in the truck, but she was a hitchhiker. I found this out later. The truck driver um, had already hurt, murdered several hitchhiking females. And this was a situation where his energy, I could see, was, I could see that as flame. He had all of these issues and it would come up as, he'd get at his anger. And his anger, he was then focusing on these young girls. And my job was to quell the anger so that he wouldn't do that to this particular girl. And I kept being drawn to that and you know, I would, I would get him all settled down to where the anger was receding. And then this girl would say something that, you know, pull it right back up again. And I did this several times and then finally I had to put that girl to sleep. I had to get her to relax so that she would stop aggravating the situation. But it finally worked out and I probably was in that session for an hour or two just working in that situation to where I felt that I could let it go. And it was just one of those things that happened. Those things have happened to me dozens of times, but mostly you don't know about it. But this one was interesting because some, I don't know, 35, 40 years later, I ran into this girl. And she was telling a story about how she was hitchhiking, got picked up by a trucker, and we went through the whole story and I would stop her and I said, wait a minute, then this happened. And you did this, didn't you? And you said these things. And then he reached over and pulled this big gun out of his, out of his uh, uh, glove compartment. And it was a really big gun. It wasn't just a pistol, but it was a really big gun. And she was, yes, yes, you know. So we went back and forth through the story and that was the lady. Okay. So years later. And indeed, um, she did survive. Uh, and the trucker, she asked the question about, well, whatever happened to him? So I went and I got in the database and saw that what did happen to him is eventually, there was a, he had killed like four, five, six people. And eventually the net was, you know, from the police and others investigating this was kind of pointing at him. So he became a person of interest. And as the police went to make that arrest, he committed suicide. He killed himself. So that's what happened. So anyway, these things can just happen where you get thrown into a situation. Can and I, for years, I, I had no connection. What was that about? No idea, because there I am, suddenly thrown in a, thrown in a truck. You know, and this thing's going on, and I know my mission is to quell the fire and not let that get out of hand, because when that pops, then this guy goes nuts. And, you know, an hour and a half, two hours later, it's like, what was that all about? You know, where did that come from? Well, don't think. It might just be a single-player game that you've been given, just and playing tonight, you know, it's, it's a... It's a non-player character, and it may just have been that, but sometimes it isn't. Sometimes you get picked to help out in a situation that is ongoing, and you get picked just because you're ready at that point to be able to do that, and you have to make those choices. So, Can I follow up on that? I'm this Because I've had this happen to me subjectively several times. Mm -hmm. But one that was most informative or instructive to me, uh, I, it's gonna take me just a moment to tell it. I was, uh, I was in meditation and boom, I was standing on a porch, I, I think it was Detroit, maybe 1930s or 40s. Uh, I'm about 100 feet from the sidewalk, this guy in a double-breasted suit, good-looking young guy, uh, starts walking down the sidewalk and I'm standing on the porch of this house. It has a, uh, um, a stained glass window. I could look inside and see there was people moving around. 
I didn't know what I was doing there. I didn't know what to do, but I watched this guy walk up the steps, gets to the top of the steps. I look, and it's me 35 years ago. And the door opens, and I follow him in, and I notice he's got two big angel wings. Now, I know that's a metaphor for something, and I'm, so I'm following him in. He doesn't see me. I'm, I'm watching all this. Uh, and time changes here in a minute. I want to point that out to you before it. I, it happens. He walks over in this living room. Uh, there was furniture, but off of that was a bay window. They'd moved the furniture aside. A woman was having a baby, a doctor, her husband, and a, and a nurse was there. Uh, the, I'll call, uh, the other me went over to uh, the baby, and he was getting messages that this, this uh, uh, baby was didn't want to be born, it wasn't ready, didn't feel like uh, its, uh, for lack of a better term, soul was synced up with the body and it was going nuts. The, uh, the entity, the, the other me, calmed it down enough, it came out, uh, it went down the birth canal, was born, and immediately started all over again, totally exploded, uh, and everything stopped. I mean, everything stood still except for the, uh, for the other me who picks up the baby, takes it over to the coffee table in the living room, and there's big tears. It was like it was just a light form. There was big tears in, in the energy field. Mm -hmm. Pulls it back together. They kept popping off. Pulls them back together, several of them, and they wouldn't stay. Calls in another all light being who comes in and just takes a light from itself and repairs it. All of the images are dead still. No time had moved. Uh, I estimated we were there in my, it wasn't actual time, but it was two and a half or three hours that it took for all this. I mean, I mm -hmm. just had that sense. No, no clocks or anything. And, and uh, probably the whole meditation probably took 10 or 12 minutes. but. Uh, that was the, the message I got. Baby, um, the baby was fine. Uh, the other me took it over, set it back down. The mini set it back down. All the actors started moving again. The, uh, uh, the other me walks right past me, doesn't see me, walks out the door. I follow him out the door, watch him walk down the street and take off. So, you know, is that another, is, is that this IUOC, uh, the IUOC working here through this body, or is that a separate one? That's what I'm looking yeah. for, and go ahead. Hard to say, could be that way. Could have been another VR that was made up just for you to make those choices. Um, there's lots of different possibilities of what it is, but fundamentally it doesn't matter which way it is. It doesn't make any difference. There's no need to sort that out. It was a situation that gave you an opportunity to make choices and to be a part of something. You learned something from it. Uh, it helped you uh, have a bigger picture. It just is what it is. So there's many possibilities of what it could have been. It could have been very literal or it could have been very uh, metaphorical. But it doesn't matter. You were engaged in it, and it was all information. It doesn't get any realer than that. So uh, think of all those things as being, they are real. You are there. You are having that experience. It doesn't really matter why or how. And you're part of it, and you did your part as best you could. And then you just let it go. And that's the point. You see, that's the point. So you take your lesson, and however that lesson came there for you, it doesn't matter. It did, and you took the lesson, and you learned from it. That's what's important. Who's next? Here. Uh, so to, to go to a more prosaic subject that was talked about yesterday, um, about diet and about sugar, uh, I completely agree with you. I would kind of expand it out to a trio of things. There's sugar and industrial seed oils and um, highly 
refined carbohydrates. And the, to me, that makes up about 75% of what's in the grocery store and 100% of what's over here in the food court. So <laughs> the, the challenge that I haven't been able to resolve, you're, you're traveling, you're on the road. I came here from Arizona for this, so I'm traveling. I'm in a hotel and driving on the freeway. When I'm away from my home environment, you know, my kitchen and my stuff, you know, I find it nearly impossible to eat the way I want to. Mm -hmm. Like, for example, yesterday I happened to pass by you and we were both, I don't know if you were going to the food court, we were both walking in the direction of it. And I went over there and there is absolutely nothing there to eat. So you're hungry and I end up going in one of the fast food places because that's all there is. And the only way that I think around this is that you have to bring your own food around with you. But I would appreciate any advice on this very <laughs> practical subject. I find it, the whole world is, uh, the world of food out there, everywhere you go is made up of all this stuff that really is, you know, it's diabetes in a glass, really. And so I, I, I don't know how to avoid it without staying in a very restricted home environment. So I'd appreciate your advice. Okay. I find that same issue, of course, and I travel a lot. Matter of fact, I seem to be traveling more of my life now than I am staying at home. So it's a, it's a lot of travel. My attitude is not to be too, um, so you say, too attached to the idea that you're going to be able to continue to eat the same kind of food that you eat when you can control it at home because it's just not going to be there when you travel. So you, you pick the lesser of the evils. Sometimes you can just stay hungry and say, well, there's nothing at lunch, I can just wait till dinner when I have a little more control over it because I can drive to the restaurant uh, of my choice. Sometimes you can just say, uh, well, I'll just get a salad. But w about you know, the quality of food is that wherever you go, whatever you do, even if you, you know, constrain yourself just to eating things that are organic, there is toxins and poisons in your food, no matter how hard you try to get rid of them. It's just where we live now. It's part of your environment. There's toxins in the air that are not good for us, that we breathe every day, but we can't hold our breath. So we breathe anyway, and we go on. Even when you buy organic things, uh, you'll find that there are toxins that are allowed in those organic things. There's toxins that, that, organ that come up out of the soil that have been put there years earlier that will get into that. So the best you can do is try to make it as good a food as possible. You're not going to eliminate poisons and toxins in the food supply. It's just impossible. Now you go get things, you know, if, you're, if your food comes out of the ocean, well, the ocean's full of plastic and mercury. You know, if you get your food um, just out of plants, well, the, you know, the people who dust crops in this part of the country, that stuff gets up in the air and it falls out 500 miles away, 1,000 miles away, that stuff falls out of the air on somebody else's crops. So there's no way to eliminate it. So I've gotten to the point that, okay, I'm going to eat food with poison in it. I'm going to eat food with toxins in it, things that will hurt me, things my body has to deal with. I'm going to breathe the air that has those kinds of things in it as well, particularly when you drive around in large cities. You know, the air pollution is going to get worse. You have air pollution in your house just from the products you use. You know, every time you open up a, a some kind of can that sprays something, you know, that puts stuff in the air. A lot of cleaners put stuff in the air. What are you going to do? Stop cleaning your bathtub? No. You're going to clean it and you're going to live with it. Or maybe you'll take the extra time to, you know, get in there with 
just water in a rough sponge and just keep scrubbing until you get it off. Or maybe you can spray some stuff on it and just wipe it off. Uh, most of us will just spray the stuff and wipe it off and breathe the fumes and that's life. And in this particular day and age, that's just one of the things we have to accept. We live in a polluted world, in a world that's full of better living through chemistry that carries a, a side effect with it. So when I travel, um, you know, I'm mostly vegan. I don't eat meat, and I don't eat dairy, and I don't eat eggs, and I don't eat sugar, and I don't eat carbohydrates very much. You know, particularly, you know, I don't eat the, the gluten and the GMO, and you know, my list of things that I don't eat is just really big. But I can't apply that everywhere. I can't even apply it at home. But I can apply it, you know, 95% at home. But I can't keep toxins out of my organic vegetables that I get because my, my uh, son was telling me uh, yesterday that, that organic vegetables can be grown using organic uh, bug killers, you know, organic herb you know, herbicides, organic uh, fungus suppressors and pesticides. And as long as the pesticide is an organic pesticide, Nobody has to mention it. Well, there's lots of organic stuff out there that'll kill you. You know, I mean, arsenic and, and stuff like that, it's all organic. It's there, it's in the environment, it grows here. You know, there's, there's lots of plants that if you eat them and they're organic, they'll still kill you. So just because that pesticide is organic and doesn't have to be mentioned, doesn't mean it isn't toxic. So you're going to find toxicity everywhere you look. And everything does not have to have its ingredients listed, and nobody has to tell you what they've done to it. So I have a second question, Tom. Yeah, thanks. So thanks. Yeah, yeah, lump it is the answer, really. You, yeah. you, can't, do, you can't do anything else. Yeah. You, know, you, li you live with it or you lump it, and you just end up lumping it because do the best you can. So I tend to eat, you know, like when I went out for lunch uh, yesterday, you know, I got a, a eggplant. Who knows what was in that eggplant? <laughs> I don't know. But I eat it and I enjoyed it and it was just fine. I just do the best I can wherever I am and, you know, my other choices were worse than that. So you enjoy it and it's, it's good. So I'm not too picky. I pretty much, when I'm traveling, eat whatever I can find, and I don't worry about it at all. If it ends up killing me, well, that's the way it is in this life. Hopefully, your immune system will be able to deal with most of it. Your liver will be able to filter all, most of it out. Uh, if you're really healthy in other ways, your body is amazing at how it can take care of that junk. Thanks, Tom. I, so my second un, completely unrelated question is there's a recurring theme through a lot of the experiences people have described here and then some that you have described. And it, so myself, I know exactly where I am. I'm on a university campus in Southern California. I know what time it is and the sun shining outside. I'm oriented and I fit within a social hierarchy and yes, a belief system and a culture. If you yank me out of that, stuff and put me like in a truck with a psychopath suddenly. I mean, to, or I, I'm not going to be able to learn or grow any or do anything until I figure out where I am. And I, I don't know if that's just me, but people I think have to have a sense of orientation um, of who and where they are. And I don't know how you, out here outside of this three-dimensional reality, how do you ever know where you are and how it relates to anything else? Maybe that's a really dumb question, but it's a recurring theme that I can't figure out. Yeah. Okay, so when I'm, when I'm in the non-physical, how do I kind of orient myself as to what, which way's up? And uh, how do I know who I am and what I'm doing and why I'm there and that sort of thing when everything is out of context? Um, you, you learn, particularly if you do a lot of out-of-body, to give up context. You don't know where you are, you don't know why you're there, you don't know any of those things, and it doesn't matter. 
because you do know what it is you're supposed to be doing. You do have a sense of what is the mission here. What are you supposed to be doing? And that just comes to you intuitively. So that is the, you know, you don't figure that out. It's just given to you. And that's, you just get used to it. Matter of fact, you get so used to it that even when you're here, you stop paying attention to context. It doesn't really matter where you are or what you're doing. You just know that here's your, here's your job and here's your mission and you just do it. And all the details aren't important. So I go through my life not knowing which way is up. You know, why I'm exactly at any particular place and what that might lead to. And what are the contexts of it and what are the possibilities of it and I've given up even trying to track all that. It really doesn't matter. I do the best I can with what I've got when I've got it and everything else just works out however it does. So it's a, it's a lifestyle that you learn to function without having any sense of context. Actually, it's easier that way. You can overthink things otherwise. Hi, Tom. I forget that this isn't <clears throat> projected, so I'll try and project. Um, this relates back to the physical body, um, which we were just talking about with nutrition, but it doesn't necessarily relate to um, nutritional health so much as it relates to um, how should we relate to the sense data from our physical bodies. And um, for me, I don't find myself as an overly physical person. Like, I don't constantly need to move, and I don't constantly need s some sort of outlet for my physical body. However, I really enjoy um, expressive things like dance um, and discipline movements such as yoga and athletics and um, the ocean and being in the ocean and, and things that are very much related to being in a physical body. And with some of those experiences, I've had very spiritual experiences, especially with yoga. Um, so my question or what I'd like to understand better is what opportunities do our physical bodies actually offer us in the way of our, our personal growth and in lowering the, the general, in lowering the entropy of the overall system when we're doing just things that are individual for ourselves, similar to something that we would do in the non-physical world, but we're very much in this physical reality working within the context of of the vehicles that we're given to do that. So how does that relate to the overall profitability of the system when we do that? And are those types of experiences um, in the same way useful for the growth of our, our personal evolution? Almost anything can be used as a meditation, can be used as a tool to help you uh, develop your intuitive side and your consciousness. It can be that you sit and meditate. It can be that you take a walk instead of sitting and meditating. It could be that you, uh, you know, play a volleyball game, something that's very physical. Whatever it is that brings you into a space where you feel wholly engaged, you feel authentic and connected and engaged and a part of you, the intuitive part, is also alive and connected. Okay, if, it's, if it's only an intellectual part, that's not going to lead you to any growth, no matter what you're doing, including meditating. But if you walk on a beach, or play volleyball, or do yoga, or do anything physical, and in the process of doing that, you let your, your um, intuition loose. You become open and connected while you're engaged in whatever you're doing, like dance. Dance is very expressive, and it's easy to just let the motions take care of themselves. 
you don't think about what you're doing with your body. Your body just moves in however way it does. And you also are in a meditation state when you're dancing. Your mind isn't just focused on what are my feet doing? What are my arms and legs doing? Your mind is let free to explore dimensions other than the physical and the uh, intellectual. So all of that is good. And all of those things can lead to a better understanding of reality, a better uh, connection between you and, and, uh, and your uh, consciousness. You as a physical being, and you as a conscious being. So they're all good. Different people need different expressions and different ways of doing things. What's important is you get, you do something that fits you. So if you happen to be a very athletic person, then yoga or one of the martial arts, um, dance, many of these things you can incorporate and they become a meditation. There's just a different form of meditation, whatever it is, whatever, you know, whatever it is that physically you connect to. And it could be something as, as you know, it could be very um, strenuous. Maybe your thing is, is running uh, obstacle courses. Well, in the process of running an obstacle course and climbing up walls and jumping over pits and doing whatever you do, that can become a meditation. You can get into that and it is as much a meditation as sitting down, crossing your legs and, and uh, you know, working with your mind. Anything can become a meditation if you go deep into yourself and let yourself free to feel, to connect, to be a part of something bigger. And a lot of athletes do that. A lot, particularly long distance runners. Most long distance runners will tell you that if you ask them exactly, you know, what happened along the route that they were running, they wouldn't be able to tell you. They know, they can tell you what route they took, but who they passed and what they did, their mind's someplace else. They're off in a meditation state while they're chugging down the street. They're not paying, they are paying attention to you know, the potholes, you know, the stones, the roots, you know, all the things that they need to be aware of, but there's another part of them that is exercising the non-physical part. So exercise can be good. I mean, physical stuff can be as valid and as useful a meditation as, as uh, just sitting with your, you know, getting comfortable and letting your mind free. A follow-up question to that is, is there a limit to the work that can be done because it's not interactive in any way? Because it's, there is that sense of that you clear your mind or that you connect with something bigger, but is there a limitation because there's not engagement with, with something that's other? Well, there can be engagement. There doesn't have to be no engagement when you're doing those things. Um, you know, a lot, of, a lot of formal meditation doesn't have much engagement either. People just go, they meditate, they let go of their sense data, they're floating in the, in the uh, you know, point consciousness, there's just a point of consciousness in the void and that's all they do. They just float in that void and don't really engage anything. So if the meditation has, is physical based, then you can do that. But you also can interact and connect and, and uh, engage with other things in a non-physical, whether you're, you're running or doing an obstacle course or doing yoga at the same time or not, doesn't matter. So I think either one is as valid and is, is as free of constraints as the other. What's important is that everybody do something that suits them. For some people, yoga just won't work, you know, or strenuous exercise just won't work. So it's not a good plan for them. Some people sitting down someplace and saying a mantra just won't work. That's not a good exercise for them. You have to do what works for you. 
and spaces that make you feel comfortable and make you feel good, and strong, and confident, those are places that you can turn into meditations. Good morning, Tom. Good morning. Um, I wanted to address or ask you to address the idea of ego as an anchor or a limiter or a trickster. So the example I would give is that I go quite often to our local city park because I feel very expansive there. I feel connected. I feel really bathed in the beauty of the whole place. And the elephant in the room there is the homeless population. Um, the park has put together a program where they employ some of them to do work on the grounds or work with the trash or whatever. And some of them are not partaking of that. But what came to me as I was walking through there enjoying is this is my opportunity to connect and shared humanity with these people. Um, and so I do, whether it's to stop and thank them for the work that they're doing and oh, keeping the park beautiful or to sit and talk to somebody and just let them talk and listen and set judgment aside and just let them pour out their story, whatever it is. Um, sometimes it's just that I will establish a relationship by passing the same person a number of days in the row and, and turn and ask their name and just tell them that I love them. Mm -hmm. it's that, it can be that simple. And I get a huge, I get really joyful when I'm doing this, like really joyful and more expansive and uh, teary-eyed and filled with love. And, and then this little voice pops up that says, you see? You're not doing that for them. You're doing this for yourself. You know, this is yourself. And, and I had listened to that, and, and I just, you know, I mean, I call bull these days on that. But it's just, uh, in my whole life, it seems like I've gotten this message of quit playing small, quit playing small. And every time I go to play big, my ego is right there trying to pull me back down again. And so I, I, I'm assuming or I'm wondering, is it ego then that's creating our fears? And ego is acting as that anchor that wants to keep us small and keep us not in communication and not connected. The, uh, it's the fear that creates the ego, not the other way around. But you know, I would say that, of course, as you do these things, any, giving anybody a sense that somebody appreciates them or that somebody cares about them, particularly if they're homeless or people who are you know, having a hard time, that is a tremendous gift to give to those people. And what is inside you is a fear of doing it wrong, that it might be ego. There's that watchful inspector who's in there saying, am I doing this right? Am I doing it for the right reasons? And that's good. You know, it's good for us to question ourselves. I tell people you need to be skeptical and mostly skeptical of yourself. But don't, you know, don't let that skepticism of yourself tell you that what you're doing is not real, that it's just coming from your intellect and it's for you. All you have to do to know that is to look at it and say, what's the result here? And if the result is, I feel joy, I feel connected, you know, I feel good that this is right, then it is. If it was just ego and you said, what's going on here, how do I feel? It, the ego would say, oh, I feel like I'm a really good person because I am you know, talking to these people and showing them that, that uh, they're appreciated. That's, it's good of me to do that. Well, then that's your ego. But that ego doesn't feel the joy in it. That ego only feels the, I'm a good person. I'm doing it right. You know, it's, it's a self-evaluation that says, yes, we can check that box. I'm helping the world check. That's the ego. But when it's, 
when it's just caring and it's love, then it's not a matter of, of, uh, of whether you're doing it right or doing it wrong. You're doing it and it feels right and it's good. So it's good, except it. But yes, that skeptical side, which always has a little fear that maybe, you know, it has to keep tight watch because that ego can be very seductive. That ego can pull you into something very, very easily. So it's good to be watchful for it, but don't be confused by it. When that ego says, well, is that really about you? Because look, you're feeling good about this. And if you feel good, is that a problem? That's not a problem. It's like, I'm feeling good, then it must be about me because I'm feeling good. No, when you are doing it right, you do feel good. But you feel good just because it is the way it is, not because and then give it a little line of facts. If it's about the facts, I feel good because I'm helping and that's a good thing to do. That's not the same as I feel good because it's all good. And you know, that's, that's the reason and that's the difference between it. When you're doing it right, there really is no specific reason why you feel good. It just is good. Good is fundamental. You don't have to justify it. If you're justifying it, it's probably intellectual. Hi, Tom. Uh, my question is about uh, switching data streams. Um, basically, I wanted to maybe get your uh, feedback on what choices can we make as far as um, our, who, who we are, and what, as far as accessing those other data streams, like what? Okay, the question is about switching data streams. Yeah, I tend to make it sound really, really easy when I say, you want to go out of body, or you just drop this data stream and grab hold of another one. What well, could be simpler than that? But then when people actually try to do that, a whole lot of questions come up. So just, how do I do that? How do you access a data stream? Uh, you do it with intent, okay? Intent is the prime motivator uh, in things happening. It's the motive force that makes things happen. So in order to have an intent to grab hold of data stream B instead of data stream A, which is this virtual reality, you have to know that there is a data stream B. And then if you know there is a data stream B, you only need an intent to receive that data. And that's what will happen. Intent is what throws the switch. But if you don't know there's a data stream B, then you're stuck. So you have to explore a bit. And some of the ways you can explore without knowing too much about what there might be to explore is to ask the larger conscious system to show you some place that where you can learn something, some place that you could go and see and interact or whatever it is and come away with, with uh, some valuable experience. And then just see what happens. Whenever I've done that, poof, I'm someplace else, I'm in some situation somewhere. And I know I, I need to find the lesson in it. You know, what is it? What is it I'm here to learn? What is it I'm here to see? What, what will it mean to me? What can I get out of this that's positive? And then once you've been there, all you need to go back is an intent. And there you are. If you talk to some non-physical entity and you want to talk to them again, all you have to do is have that intention. And there you are. Okay. Now, that in the beginning seemed like that's problematical. You mean whenever I have an intent, this poor entity that's maybe off, you know, having lunch or trying to take a nap or something is going to get jerked out and say, yeah, you, you got to have a conversation with this person because he had an intent, you know, and I thought that doesn't seem right. But no, it's not like that. You can connect with consciousness just with an intention because all consciousness is netted. We're all netted. Just like, just like the internet, 
you know, we're all netted. And on the internet, the intent is typing in a URL. And as soon as you hit the enter button, then that's the intention to go there, and that's where you go. And it works the same way with consciousness. So I have an intention to communicate or connect to um, some other consciousness. The intent will make the connection. It doesn't necessarily mean that that person will intellectually be aware of the connection, but I'll communicate with their consciousness just the same, and they with me, and we can have a conversation. And if that person is sensitive, and if they are at a point where they can have that awareness, they may be aware of every word intellectually. And we may actually have a conversation just like you would over the telephone. But most of the time that's not the case. They're busy doing something else. Or maybe it's three o'clock in the morning and they're part of the world and they're fast asleep. You can still connect with their consciousness and you can still have that conversation. And when they wake up or when they are in a position to deal with it, they will feel that connection. They will get that information. And they will feel that it's come out of their own intuition. It'll just be an intuitive thing that they know. And they may think about you. Oh, you know, I wonder what Fred's doing today, you know, because they've been interacting with Fred. So people will get it. The communication happens, whether the other person is intellectually aware of it. There's another whole part of you that's not attached to your intellect or your memory. You can be doing all sorts of things while you're fast asleep. Your consciousness can be active and interactive and be helping people and doing things that you'll never know about because there's a whole other dimension of you that is not intellectual and is not physical, that is active and available to connect and interact. And you'd be totally unaware of it unless you develop that part of you to be aware of it. The more you develop that part, then the more aware of it that you're going to be. You know, so how many times have you uh, just out of the blue, you think about some old friend you haven't seen for 20 years. Their name just comes up. Oh, I wonder how they're doing. I haven't thought about them for a long time. And within a day or two, you run into them. They send you an email. The phone rings, and that's who it is. How does that work? Well, you know, you're probably thinking about them because they were thinking about you. And maybe they're thinking about you because you were thinking about them. Somewhere it starts. Somewhere somebody has a, oh, I wonder what happened to so-and-so. And that then triggers so-and-so because then they say, gee, I wonder what happened to them. And pretty soon, you know, the phone rings. That just, you know, that just happens a lot. That's because we're all connected, but it's not because we're doing a voice communication. We communicate with others all the time on this other channel, if you will, that's non-physical, and it's not a part of our intellect. Lots of times we communicate with people. Yeah. Those people who kind of have a habit of being at the right place at the right time, and they have a habit of saying the right things just at the right time, and a habit of not saying the wrong things at just the right time, mostly it's not because they're so lucky, it's because they're plugged in to that non-physical telepathic communication. So they get a sense of what they need to say or not say or do, and they may not have any idea why they feel that way or where that comes from or where that knowledge was, but it's just there. But they've done it enough that they begin to rely on it. When that information is there, they trust it. Well, that builds confidence, and confidence opens the channel. So we all do that, more or less. And as we get more and more uh, developed on our intuitive side, it becomes more intentional and not just haphazard. Tom, there is a, a theory with the following assumptions. Different reality frames have different clock speeds, frequencies. 
A player logs on to a particular reality frame by resonating to the same frequency by pulsing conscious awareness at that frequency. In other words, consciousness is or can be digital in the sense that it can have on-off states pulsing at a particular rate. And that our core beliefs create our emotional state, which affects our frequency. As our core beliefs grow toward love, our frequency increases so that we can ascend to higher frequency realms of love. Mm -hmm. In other words, the, the core is, does, is consciousness able to pulse, have on-off states? The very first statement you read about all the reality frames each have their own clock, check. Everything else that had to do with frequency is metaphorical. That's a metaphor. Frequency is a metaphor. It's not an actual thing. Consciousness is not turning on and off and sinking frequencies and whatever. Yes, we can connect to other things. And if we connect to them, we may metaphorically represent that as being we uh, resonate with them. Resonance kind of brings up a resonance frequency because that's something in our physical world. But these are ideas and concepts that are in our physical world, like vibration. Vibration only makes sense in terms of space. Vibrate means move back and forth. Well, that means there's a back and a forth. There's changes in, in space. It's a, it's, a, it's a concept that's attached to the physical reality, to this virtual reality. It's not a fundamental concept. It's just the way this reality is. When you go to a dream reality, you don't necessarily have back and forth. You don't have the same kind of spatial constraints that you have in this reality, because the dream reality, the rule set's a lot looser. So the, the metaphor of frequency and that growing up and, and uh, reducing the entropy of your consciousness is raising the frequency of your consciousness, metaphorical. That doesn't mean that it isn't good, and it doesn't mean that it doesn't explain things. It just means that it's not a fundamental thing. There really isn't things out there turning on and off and waving and so on. Those are just metaphors to help us explain and understand things. Can I try a, a, a different theory that um, says that the, uh, the clutter of thoughts we have that Buddhists call the monkey mind isn't coming from the player, but is part of the avatar's nature to constantly generate reports sort of like a, GPS, a dumb GPS generating a constant flow of perceived dangers and recommendations, etc. In other words, as Sufi mystic Rumi said, we are not our thoughts, we are the silence between our thoughts. As a result, the player communicates with their avatar through emotion, so that if the player is on the right path, they feel excitement, joy, etc. Now, again, um, I would say that that's not the way I, I would see it. You know, he's, this person, whoever wrote that, is talking about the avatar is something more than just an avatar. You know, an avatar, like your elf in World of Warcraft. <laughs> She's cute, isn't she? <laughs> that, that avatar in World of Warcraft, that elf, what is it feeling? What is it thinking? What is it doing? What is its active contribution to the player? Nothing. An avatar is just information that is a picture to allow the consciousness and the computer to visualize what it is that's going on. So the avatar doesn't bring anything to it. The avatar doesn't create noise. The avatar doesn't create anything. The avatar is just information to show us a picture of the reality that we imagine. That's all. So the avatar doesn't bring something to it or prevent something from happening. It's all about consciousness and all about information. Avatar is a, a uh, just a computation. 
the avatar doesn't have free will, the avatar doesn't whatever, but we tend to think it does because we think that we are the avatar, that consciousness is in our head, that uh, you know, we are aware and whatever. And it's hard to let that idea go. It's really hard for us to let that idea go. So, we, so people will take that idea and instead of letting it go, they'll say, well, the avatar does some things. You know, it, it's got some stuff it has to do, and the consciousness has its stuff to do, and now you have a model that has these two things, and that's just unnecessary complication. So I'd say that isn't, uh, that wouldn't be so good a model, just because it's more complicated than necessary. And last question, if nobody, is somebody else going next? Okay. Well, who generates the, our dreams? Is it LCS or our player generating the Who dreams? generates your dreams? Yeah. It depends. The dreams can come from several places. Um, one place is yourself. You can, you can drive your dreams. And we know that that happens in times when we are... Um, well, obsessed isn't the word, but we're doing something and we're so intense on it for so long that we dream about it too, right? It's Christmas time and you have 200 people on your Christmas card list and you have to do 200 Christmas cards and you and your wife sit down and okay, this is Christmas card night and you spend six hours licking envelopes and stuffing cards in envelopes, you know, and then you put it in there and next. You know, it's like an assembly line, and you do it, and you do it, and you do it, and what do you dream about the next night? <laughs> Looking at envelopes and doing Christmas cards, right? That's what you dream about, because that's what was in your mind. Well, that's your own creation, so you can create things in dreams, or you have problems going on at work, and you can, you know, that can be part of a scenario for what your dreams are, where you're just, you are working out possibilities and ways of interacting in your dreams. So we can be part of that creator of the dreams. On the other hand, a lot of dreams are entirely given by the system because it's, a, it's another opportunity to give you very specific choices, like the fear tests. Nobody goes out and says, I'm gonna give myself a fear test because if you're giving it to yourself, it isn't gonna work because you know it's just you giving it to yourself, so that's not so scary. It has to come from outside of you. So those sorts of things are done by the system, giving you a fear test. And sometimes there's other choices. Um, you know, suddenly you are, what, running from a big monster who is, for some reason, trying to get you. You don't know exactly where the monster came from, where you are, why it's trying to get you, but you just know that this is it and you have to get away. Well, that's probably the system giving you that. that you know, think about that as, a, again, a single-player game. You have choices to make. What are you going to do? And the right choice is probably to go deal with the monster, not just avoid it. And what happens in those cases is every time you avoid it, you get it again. It's unavoidable. Oh, you dive in a, in a, you know, you dive through a portal into a different reality, and then you turn around and, oh, there it is. You can't get rid of it. Or you do this or that, or you wake yourself up and you stay awake and figure, well, next night won't be that way, and next night it's not a monster, it's something else. But it's the same scenario going over and over again because the system's giving you a, a virtual reality for, you to make the right choice in. And when you make the right choice, it stops. You don't get that anymore. Well, it's not quite true. You make the right choice, you'll get it a couple of more times just to make sure you've really got that choice right, and then it stops. Yeah, I can attest to that. I had uh, nightmares growing up as a child that I was in a city and uh, basically Godzilla, Tyrannosaurus, giant monster was coming yeah. and I was a little late getting out of town and it would peek into the place where I was and just was coming to get me and so on. Yeah. And when I eventually, I had the nightmare and realized, well, wait a minute, this is a dream. So I don't really have to be afraid of Godzilla and I confronted it 
and it shrunk down into a teeny little cute Godzilla that ran away and never had the dream yeah, again. That's the point. So these are, these are single player games, you know, in a virtual reality of stop running and turn around and face your issues. That's the, that's the lesson, deal with it. Deal with it, even if it's, you know, this 800 pound gorilla with big fangs and three heads and whatever, you say, how can little me deal with that? Well, you have to deal with it and you have to accept however that works out. So that's the lesson. So sometimes it's the system giving us lessons, sometimes it's us, sometimes it's a combination of both of those. Like if we're working, say, at the office and there's this big office politics going on and so on and it's a problem and it's been on your mind a lot, well, the system may give us a dream that symbolizes all of that going on to give us opportunity to try several different approaches. Well, if we try this, what would happen and that? So then that's a combination between us and the system helping us work out issues that we're having trouble with to make choices. So it's, it's all of the above. Sometimes just us, sometimes just them, sometimes a, a game between us. It's just that dream reality is just another place to have experiences where you can make choices and grow up, evolve or de-evolve. Thank you very much. That's it, lunchtime? Lunchtime, thank you very much. Okay.